So I want to start by going back in time to 2004. Um, 2004 was a year that marked my own start in digital politics. It was also my first full election cycle. And it was also the year of the first PDF. And it was the year that a lot of cool and innovative things happened on the campaign front, from Howard Dean and his famous bat. Um, it was shockingly hard to find pictures of this on the internet. I had more pictures, I think, of this on my local machine than I, did on, than I could find on the internet. And to George W. Bush, the campaign that I worked on. And this is personal to me. And in the obligatory embarrassing photo to kick off a presentation like this, um, and it's a very quintessentially Republican photo, um, <laughs> I would think. And I think we can say definitively that a lot of things have changed since then. First of all, you probably don't need a tie to go meet the president uh, the day after the election. I think I know a few people who've actually gotten away with that. Hats off to you. Um, and this picture today, you'd need a wide angle lens to take it. It would be a lot bigger. There are hundreds of people working in digital on campaigns, not to mention thousands um, around the world. And I think the challenge of how do we integrate um, technology into an organization was one that we thought of um, very extensively back then and continue to think about today. And in this super secret strategy, uh, ca internal campaign strategy document from 10 years ago, we reveal how we actually thought of it. Um, so I don't think I'm giving too much away. Um, but we write at the bottom, it's a little bit small text, the e-campaign, I know, it's kind of a dorky title, uh, we've gotten away from that, is a micro-representation of the campaign or party. So the idea was um, we were going to do and replicate everything um, that you could do offline in an online experience. Um, and this was reflected in sort of the navigation structure that we put on our website and just the ability um, to do all of these very specific actions for which there was a very robust and built out um, offline component already, mapping those familiar offline experiences um, to the web. Um, and it's a pattern we've seen again and again in the first Obama campaign and in the second one as well. Um, again, building um, tools that um, you know, simply replicate um, what people are used to doing offline, using offline as the dominant um, frame of reference. But I think if there's a flaw with this and, and if there's something that, um, you know, in reconsidering this, um, it's the fact that while I think we did a good job of explaining that um, there isn't um, a part of, an, of a campaign or an organization. What you see here are three big bubbles um, for um, fundraising, um, political field work, and communications, or you could also think of them as the three M's of campaigns, message, money, and mobilization. Though I think we articulated the fact that um, digital was, had a role to play in all of these facets, um, it, there was also, um, the kind of the flaw in it, it was just kind of still a tiny sliver there in the middle, and there were other huge aspects of this that wouldn't necessarily be touched by data and technology at all. And if we were redrawing this slide today, what would it look like? I think it would probably look like something like this, that you'd still have something central and focused on today, technology and analytics, I think is what you'd call it. And it would be bigger, and it would encomp literally encompass all of these different uh, parts of an organization. And certainly, um, while these are specific to a campaign, um, you can analogize them to other um, core business functions or to nonprofits. Um, and it's important to remember, though, that even though technology is sort of the bigger bubble in this, in this construct, it does not subsume the traditional organizing and messaging functions. It's, it simply serves as a platform. It's an enabler that makes the entire system run better and supports the entire system in everything that it does. So in thinking about the progression and where we have come um, from 10 years ago, I think let's start to think about perhaps where we might go and what that might look like. 
Um, I think for the last 10 years, we've kind of been focused, I think, on code, on building applications that, again, these sort of applications that map um, the offline experience. I think the next 10 years is going to be about how do we make entire systems work better. We've talked about kind of online systems replicating and using offline as sort of a map. And I think um, there's going to be a much greater emphasis on the offline systems being transformed themselves by technology and data, um, using every, everything that's not on the internet, learning from what, what is on the internet. Um, we hear a lot about sort of the power struggles within organizations. Um, between digital and traditional. And increasingly, I think we're going to see those distinctions not make much sense anymore. And I think while we were you know, really consumed by building digital tools and digital infrastructure, what's going to be more important moving forward into what I'm calling the post-digital decade is digital thinking. How are you applying a mindset and a methodology to make the entire system work better? So I think the most, some of the most interesting things that happened in 2012 and are happening in 2014 in politics don't have anything whatsoever to do with the internet and don't have anything whatsoever, don't necessarily even require a network connection. TV, the sort of dinosaur of, of, of politics and the dinosaur of marketing, um, you know, in, 20, in 2012, um, set-top box data made traditional TV ads up to $80 million more efficient. And that was money that could be spent more efficiently elsewhere um, because of that, um, because of that use of technology on an age-old um, tactic and tool that was used. Um, moving forward, and for, by four, year, from four, four years from now, um, up to 20% of traditional TV media buying will be programmatic, meaning you can buy a TV ad in the same way you might buy a digital ad today, and in a sense, making TV a technology platform. And I think the question of voter contact um, will not be something that's necessarily we're trying to create bolt-on experiences um, that sort of replicate um, the offline, but I think are, can naturally and seamlessly happen um, online through social environments that naturally connect you um, to your friends. This was done very effectively in 2012 and is being used um, by both sides um, in 2014. But this metaphor, um, I think, goes far beyond just politics. So I, th this metaphor, I think, it's, it, it's, it, it's shaping business, it's shaping culture. And what does that mean? I think the fact that you look at a service like Netflix, um, do we think about it as inherently a technology platform or is it just TV? Or Uber, is it a smartphone app or is it just a way of getting from place to place? Bitcoin, is it the future of money or is it just money? The way we answer these questions might be slightly different today than how we might answer them in the future, but it's very clear um, where this is going. And the things all of these platforms have in common is that they are engineered as end-to-end -end solutions that elegantly blend technology with the things that people have been doing for generations. And I think we're going to see a lot of that in politics. But what about legacy institutions? What about institutions that have been around for a while, for maybe over 100 years? How do they adapt? And I think these issues were very... Um, very thoroughly and thoughtfully captured in the recent New York Times innovation report. Here is a, a, an, an organization that I think is committed to doing the right thing, to moving into the digital age, but was still stuck in a print mindset and still believed in this sort of cult of the front page that was not necessarily giving um, digital the attention that it deserved, and the report went through many really good recommendations um, for um, you know, how they might solve this issue um, and how they might um, make better use of digital media. But I think the one thing that they didn't cover was the question of leadership. Jill Abramson was arguably fired for trying to put a digital person as the number three person at the New York Times, and I think my personal opinion 
is that for them, this problem won't necessarily be solved until a digital native is the number one person at the New York Times and has people who believe in that um, in throughout, all senior, throughout the ranks of their leadership. I think we also saw this to some degree with healthcare.gov. There has been tremendous work done over the last few years in terms of putting um, technologists into government. Um, and we can ask after that, why did this, the initial launch of the website seem to fail so miserably? It's because the entire system was rigged and was by the federal acquisition regulation that essentially mandated um, that the work go um, to the incumbent. Um, so I think there's a cautionary tale and it's analogous to you know, these metaphors of digital being sort of this bolt thing we bolt on at the end. That can no longer work. Um, I think you have to listen to the technologies, to technology and the technologists from the very beginning and you have to engineer systems from the very beginning um, with that in mind. I want to close with, I think, reminding, I think, something that I think, a reminder that technical skill is no longer enough to succeed. You know, the age of technologists and early adopters kind of innovating in a corner and obviously developing the right tools and the right solutions is not necessarily going to be enough moving forward when technology is at the core of is it really at the core of everything and at the core of many different industries from politics to government to um, some of the platforms we talked about earlier. Um, and what that means is we have to solve the very real and political challenge of how do digital people and digital natives actually step up and lead these organizations or create new ones. And that's the work of the next 10 years, it's not inherently a digital challenge. In many ways, we've solved many of the digital problems. It is, I like to call it a post-digital challenge, and it's a leadership challenge. And I think what it will take is digital natives taking, um, you know, taking greater roles of responsibility, not as a digital director on a campaign, or a chief innovation officer, or as a CEO, or a CTO, but as a CEO, as a president, and as an executive editor. It's something I think we have to have the courage to admit and we have to have the courage to lead. I'm very confident and optimistic um, that this will happen. Thank you. <laughs>